And, you know, uh, there was already a question in the chat box about pine warblers. Uh, are they back? Well, you know, pine warblers don't really, don't really leave. Some of them do, right? Um, they, they, they're short distance mi migrants. Uh, we typically, at least in, in my, um, you know, time here in South Carolina or back in South Carolina, uh, I see, I see, it seems like more maybe, uh, in my own yard in the, uh, in the winter time, but you know, there's a lot of them that, that come down, uh, south from up north, uh, for the winter. And then I have my, my feeders, uh, full of, um, sunflower seeds. And then I have the suet and they just really love that. But I think I've counted, I think a high of around seven, eight or nine, um, you know, uh, on the feeder or around the feeder at one time in the, uh, in, in the winter. Uh, but they're they're a bird that we'll see year year round. Um, and then another comment, I think uh, someone was seeing a lot of little yellow and brown birds, and and we'll talk about that uh, today. But uh, you know, uh, I figured I'd uh, kind of ex show through a photograph um, the frustrations of uh, of fall birding, right? Um, maybe some, some people would rather swim with alligators than than bird in the fall time. I remember whenever I was just getting into it. Um, you know, I, boy, I would study and study and study and study um, in preparation for, for fall migration just because, you know, these birds look so similar. And, you know, on this, on this first page, we're seeing four different species. Um, but, but look how similar they look. Um, you, you really have to kind of um, focus in on these, on these small details. And we'll talk about those details, um, you know, throughout this presentation. Uh, and, you know, just to kind of get this, get this started with, with some ID tips here. But, um, you know, one thing, since we were just talking about the pine warbler, one thing you'll notice on the pine warbler, and this is a nice, a nice male, um, are the wing bars. Now, you can't see them on this, but we'll see another picture. Uh, they do have wing bars, you know, similar, similar to the black Bernian warbler here, but these are maybe a little bit more smudged. And whenever I think about IDing birds, I kind of try to associate or um, compare it with something in my life. So this is my oldest son here, and he's very calm, um, a studious kid. This is my wild man here uh, that you can see. And for me, if, he, if, if my wild man here was going to put um, uh, wing bars on a bird, they would probably look like this. He'd probably get a crayon, uh, hold it really hard, press really hard, and you can get these kind of wide really white wing bars um, my oldest son he'd probably you know take a take his time and maybe with a fine a fine point you know pencil uh, or crayon you know uh, make these nice wing bars here so uh, these birds have these you know subtle differences and whenever whenever I'm trying to remember birds I kind of think about those types of things to help me remember uh, the different details on on birds um, you know, so this this does have, uh, or these do have wing bars, the pine warblers. Think about a Cape, Cape May warbler. Um, they're going to either have a wing patch, okay, so a white blob on their wing, or not really much at all. So, you know, just, just the, the sides of the birds, the wings of the birds can can tell you, um, you know, or, or at least help you narrow it down to a, to a number of species, what, what that bird could be. Um, but these birds are coming down right now uh, from uh, Canada, uh, from the Northeast um, United States, and they're heading back down. Some, some will stay here in South Carolina. Think about a Baltimore Oriole. Uh, we do have some that winter here in South Carolina. Um, but some are going to winter in Florida, others in the Caribbean. Um, think about a Swainson's warbler going out to Jamaica uh, to spend its, its winter uh, months. Not too bad, right? Um, we have some like the prothonotary warbler. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go all the way to Columbia, South America. Um, some of its population will uh, winter about 25% about uh, will winter in Mexico. Um, and then again, uh, in, in Central America as well. You think about our summer tanagers. Uh, um, you know, they're pretty abundant here in South Carolina. Uh, you could go down to Costa Rica in February and, and see them down there. So these birds are fat, fattening up right now um, and just kind of passing through the states and, uh, you know, just, just making their way to, the, uh, to their southern wintering grounds. Um, and a lot of the photos that I have on here, um, we have a couple local uh, talented photographers, uh, Cameron Foster and Vance Solseth, and then a lot of them are taken from uh, Merlin Bird ID and allaboutbirds.org um, if you're wondering about the photos. Um, 
So the challenge is there is a lot of yellow out there right now. Um, not just, you know, yellow birds, uh, but there, there are yellow leaves and there's going to continue to be more and more yellow leaves, right? Um, we have yellow flowers uh, and not to say you're going to confuse, uh, you know, a bird with a flower really. Um, but, you, you know, if you see yellow in a, in a tree, uh, you might just kind of dismiss it thinking it's a, uh, it's a leaf. Or if you see one in the shrubs, you might just kind of uh, dismiss it um, if you see uh, some yellow. Uh, as, a, as a flower or something. So you, you have to kind of uh, watch a little bit more closely, you know, watch for, you, you have to really look for motion, um, I guess more so now than you typically would in the springtime. Um, my, my next little bullet point is they aren't really vocalizing uh, much at all. You might hear a, a chip here, here and there. Um, you know, I have heard yellow-throated vireo singing still, um, some red-eyed vireo singing. Um, I, you know, Northern Perulas seem to always make some, make some noise, but other than that, really haven't heard uh, birds making too much, too much noise um, uh, recently. So, you know, you, this time of year, you really have to use your eyes more uh, than your ears, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, just because the birds aren't, aren't you know, vocalizing uh, much at all. Um, you can see here, these are, you know, almost every picture is a different bird. And to, to the one person's point that they're, they're seeing <laughs> a lot of yellow and brown, uh, welcome to fall birding. So uh, we'll, we'll dig into that and into some tips how to identify these guys in a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Greg wants to know, is the movement of migrants motivated more by weather um, and cooler temps or by changing food availability? Great question, Greg. Yeah, usually it's... Uh, uh, the, the, the light starts changing, uh, you know, whenever we start getting into to fall time. And I, I do believe that's, that's the cue for them to start uh, migrating down. Um, you know, weather can play, play a role. Uh, if, if it got super cold um, and things started freezing up, that would obviously, you know, push some birds down. Um, but, you know, you think about all these uh, caterpillars that are out right, right now and the, the migration of all all these, I mean, we're talking about billions of birds right now, not, not hundreds of thousands and millions, but billions of birds right now pushing through the United States. Um, and it's really cool to me um, to, to kind of think about how those two things have evolved, the, the insects and the birds uh, migration uh, time. And, uh, you know, these, these birds are pushing down right now, uh, basically because of the time of year uh, and its change from summer to fall, but it just happens to coincide with, uh, with a nice caterpillar season. Um, so I hope, I hope that helped. Um, you know, I've heard people say uh, things like, yeah, they're, they're more secretive this time of year. Um, I would just say they're not breeding. Um, and so they're not as bright, um, a lot of the species at least. Um, they're not making, they're not singing. Um, I don't know if that makes them more secretive, but it just makes them, uh, I guess, more quiet, right? Um, they blend in a little bit better, but if you watch the birds, you know, think about an American red start. Um, it, it's really sporadic in, in the way it feeds, you know, it kind of jumps around all over the place. Um, it's still feeding the same way. So I don't know if they're more secretive. I just think they're duller birds. They're not as bright. Um, and they're not vocalizing. Um, so again, but, but when I hear that, it, it, just, it just says to me, you gotta really pay attention um, you know, when you're out there a little bit more than you would in the, in the springtime, just because you, you can't rely on your, your ears as much. Um, finding the best places to bird, we'll talk about that. Um, and it can still be hot out. Uh, I, know, I know last year when we went up to uh, Clemson or the South Carolina Botanical Garden, uh, we, had a, we had a hot day and it was, I think, mid to, to late September. So sometimes it can still be hot. You might have one of those kind of just quiet, still humid, you know, hot days. Um, so uh, that can be challenging as well. Um, but it'll, it'll break and, uh, you know, we'll get some nice clear days out there uh, pretty soon. Well, just, just like what we're having right now. Um, and I, I think the question, there, there was also a part about weather having, having an effect on them. They will follow fronts down. Um, you think about a, a, a front, you know, moving, moving uh, south. Uh, they'll ride that um, so they can serve, they can conserve energy. Uh, so, you know, if there's a nice front that comes through, uh, I like to bird the next day if I can. 
So overcoming these challenges, uh, if you're trying to find a place to bird, uh, use eBird. Um, you know, I did a, a Facebook Live, I think last week, and we, uh, I kept on having questions about, hey, are these birds in the area this time of year? Um, and I wasn't, you know, too familiar with the area that I was in. Um, and I, I just told them to look at eBird. Um, so, you know, go to eBird, uh, super easy, sign up. Uh, you can submit your sightings, your bird sightings from anywhere in the world. Um, and it's a really great way to, to keep up with all, all your uh, birds that you've seen um, and it will make you a better birder. So if I'm visiting South Carolina, I've never been here before and I want to find a, you know, Cape May warbler in the fall time, I can go to eBird and see where they're seen in the fall time. Uh, so get familiar with that website um, and you'll find, you'll find uh, the, the areas that uh, you can locate these birds in. Uh, the warbler guide, uh, which which I had it in my, my office, but the reception wasn't great there. So I moved out of here and I forgot it. But the warbler guide is probably the best uh, warbler identification book out there. Um, it's fantastic. It'll give you, you know, what the bright birds look like. Uh, so the bright birds are the springtime birds. Um, and then they'll give you what the dull birds look like. So the dull birds are the fall time birds, um, the juveniles, okay? Um, and just really, really great. It'll give you comparisons. So, so let's take the Tennessee warbler. Um, it could be possibly confused with a pine warbler. It might be confused with a red-eyed vireo. And so it'll, it'll uh, give you these uh, comparisons and, and tell you uh, how to differentiate those birds uh, in that book. But really thick book, a bunch of pictures, uh, and seriously, probably, um, the best warbler guide, in my opinion, out there. Uh, so if you don't have it, uh, get it. It's a, it's a fantastic book. Uh, Merlin Bird ID and all about birds.org are great resources online. Uh, you know, Audubon has uh, a great um, app as well, and I'm sure there's others out there. Those are the, the, the two that I like to use. I don't, I don't want to clog my phone too, too much whenever I'm out in the field. So those are the, those are the, um, I guess the, the, the techie things that I use whenever I'm out. Uh, get out early. Um, you know, I like to get out at 7 a.m. Um, it, it can be a little chilly this year or this time of year, um, but you know, you'll see or hear at least, you know, really cool things, you know, in, in terms of, I, I'm thinking about owls uh, whenever I'm talking about what, what we might hear this time of year. Um, so get up early uh, and get out there early. And when you do, uh, I like to bird around, uh, where the sun is hitting the trees. Um, so I always think about, I don't know, let's say Saluda Shoals. Um, you go out to the education center and in, in, in that parking lot there, and you can see what are around you where the sun is, is hitting, you know, these tall trees. Um, and notice those areas, they'll be a lot more active than the shady areas that are cooler. And what I think is happening is, is the insects are, are warming up, they're becoming more active and the, uh, the, the birds are finding them. Um, so just a little tip there, especially for chilly weather um, birding. Uh, let's see, bird with the sun at your back. Obviously, you don't want to be looking at the sun or looking at birds, uh, you know, with the sun behind them. You want the sun behind your back. The birds will look better too. Uh, they'll be brighter, uh, lit, lit up by the sun. Um, find the bird food and uh, you'll find the birds. You know, you look at these yellow neck cat caterpillar moths uh, on, on our blueberry uh, bushes in, in our yard. Uh, that blueberry bush doesn't have any more leaves on it uh, either, <laughs> uh, we, but we have 17, so we're, uh, we're doing okay on the blueberries. Uh, but, you know, that's bird food right there. So, um, you know, think about uh, planting natives in your, in your yard um, or going to a park that, you know, has, has a lot of natives, has a lot of oak trees. Um, oaks are fantastic. Um, and if you've taken one of my classes before, uh, you know, you've, you've heard that they're a host plant for over around 560 uh, caterpillars uh, or moths and butterflies, okay? So the mama moth and the, or the mama butterfly knows that she can uh, place her egg on that leaf and she knows that her, her caterpillar, whenever it hatches, can, can digest those chemical components of, uh, of those leaves. So oaks are fantastic. Hickories are great. Uh, maples are good. Uh, so, so find the native, native trees and, and shrubs and you, you should be able to find plenty of food for those birds. Uh, find edges. Um, you know, I, I like where a creek or a river kind of meets a forest or a field. Um, so, so water is fantastic. Even a small pond can, can really produce uh, some great birds. 
Um, but edges, you know, support more wildlife than, you know, just, just a patch of forest. So um, if, you can, if you can find a place, um, you know, even a power line, it might not be the prettiest place to, to bird, um, but they're fantastic uh, in terms of uh, the variety of birds that you'll see, um, you know, at, at, those, at those places. So bird edges, uh, really great, great places. Uh, find green parks, parks in cities and towns. Um, the first thing I think about is 14 Mile Creek in Lexington. You know, you have a Lowe's, you have a Home Depot, you have a gigantic Walmart, tons of concrete around, tons of cars, but then you have this small, you know, skinny half mile um, trail and it's bordered by 14 Mile Creek, uh, nothing, nothing big. Um, and then it has a lot of, a lot of uh, native trees. Um, and a lot of native uh, bushes and offers a ton of green, which offers a ton of food uh, in, in the form of insects to these birds that are flying down. So if I'm a, you know, if I'm a migrating, um, you know, blue wing warbler and I'm flying down from Pennsylvania, I just crossed a couple of states, I'm in Lexington now, and where am I gonna go? I'm, I'm not gonna go to, to Walmart, right? I'm not gonna go to Lowe's, uh, but there is this patch of green right there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop down uh, into that patch of green um, and uh, find some food. So uh, those areas of green within cities and towns can be really great. Um, the USC horseshoe, uh, I've birded it once, but I know a lot of great birds can be seen right there in those, those beautiful oaks right there in the, in the horseshoe. So you'll, you'll see, it's really cr crazy to think about it. You'll see these, you know, uh, migratory bird species that were, might've been breeding way up in Canada. They're heading down to Central America or Mexico or South America, and they're stopping in, you know, uh, the USC horseshoe uh, in, in between to, to help them fatten up and help them create those, uh, those fat reserves uh, for their trip. So, um, you know, keep that in mind whenever you're birding. You don't, you don't necessarily have to go to a thousand acre, you know, national wildlife refuge, although they're great, um, to, to bird. Um, and then study. Um, you know, this isn't something where that, that I just, you know, understood overnight. Um, I've been, you know, birding now for about 10 years. And I mean, I guess maybe every day I, 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 I look at something to help me uh, become a better birder. Um, I love it, um, but just understand that. Um, and I still make mistakes. I've been with people that have their PhDs. They make mistakes whenever you're out. You're trying to find a bird that, that might be 60 feet in the air it's, it's, or in the tree. It's moving. Um, you, you might misidentify it, and that's okay. Um, you know, try to learn from it, but study. So uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and dig into some of these birds. Uh, so black and orange, uh, this is the bird that changed my life. I was in insurance before I uh, started, started this. Uh, and uh, I, I saw this Baltimore Oriole one day and it was uh, one of the most beautiful things I've, I've ever seen in my life. And uh, you know, we, we have those right here in South Carolina and that is one that will winter uh, more on the coast than here in the Midlands. Um, but it will winter in South Carolina. Um, and you're ju just talking about mistakes. Uh, whenever I first put this uh, bird down on this presentation, I just glanced at it real quick and put pine warbler underneath it, right? Because look at it. It has yellow, not, not really streaking at all. Um, you know, a pine warbler is going to have usually some diffused uh, streaking right here. Um, it does have, you know, the, the wing bars. Uh, but then, you know, I, I just kind of looked at pine warbler and then I looked at this and I was like, wait, that's not a pine warbler, but look at this beak. It's got two colors. Look how, look how pointy and sharp and uh, just this general shape. It's a, it's a lot larger than, than what, a, what a warbler would have. Um, so, you know, I changed it to Baltimore Oriole and got it corrected. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about those pine warblers here in just a little bit and you'll see the difference uh, in, in, that, in those beaks. Um, the American Red Star, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful bird that's pushing through right now. Quite a few have been seen. Um, you can go on eBird and uh, just kind of look up. I'm in Lexington County, so just look up Lexington County or whatever county that you're in and see what birds have been uh, spotted. Um, so that one's pushing through right now. Uh, that's a great bird to, to see. The, the, the males are, the mature males are going to still look like this. They, they're going to have that charcoal blackish um, with, those, with those nice orange spots. 
the juveniles and the females are going to look like this. Uh, but in the trees and, and the shrubs, they're, they're pretty sporadic. Um, I kind of, if, if y'all ever watch Seinfeld, they kind of move like Kramer, just, uh, just really um, kind of all over the place. Um, they're not very calm foragers. Um, and then the Baltimore Oriole, I typically see those, you know, relatively high in trees. Um, the American Red Star, um, kind of mid canopy uh, below, you can kind of see them at eye level sometimes. But a lot of times whenever I see Baltimore Orioles, they're, they're you know, pretty high in the tree, although you can um, attract them with, with orange halves and, and grape jelly. Um, so if you're one of those that, that has them in your, your yard <clears throat> this time of year, um, I'm jealous because, uh, because I, I, I've only had one this, this year and I just got a, a really quick uh, glance at it. Um, let's go to this next one. So some, some birds, you know, change their, their, their clothes, their feathers, and, and some birds don't. Uh, we have worm, worm eating warbler right here. And then we have an oven bird. And this is a good example of how to find birds this time of year. You know, in the, in the springtime, I hardly have any problem finding these birds because, you know, this oven bird has one of the, the most piercing, beautiful, you know, calls or songs rather um, in the springtime. This, this worm eating warbler also has this, it's kind of like a chipping sparrow, like a, like a machine gun, um, you know, song. And so when I'm sitting out or I'll have my windows open uh, at the house in the springtime, I can actually hear them. I could, I could sit here and work and I can actually hear them. Then, you know, I go grab my binoculars and, and, uh, and go out. Well, I can't do that this time of year. There could, I could have 15 different warblers out there right now and I have no idea because they're not vocalizing. Um, but, you know, so right now you, you just have to really, really just get out there, get out there and, uh, and use your eyes a lot, a lot more than, than you would. I know that sounds funny, but you, you, you do a lot more than you would in the springtime. Uh, worm eating warblers, I typically don't see them, you know, too, too high in the canopy. So think about mid canopy. Um, and then the oven bird, I would say low canopy uh, to the ground. Um, and even, you know, I was talking about the warbler guide, that book. Um, it'll, it'll uh, for each species, let you know where these birds can, can be found. Um, and it's really bizarre to see that they, the birds kind of stick to that. Every now and then you'll see something, you know, way up in a tree, 60 feet up, that typically is on the ground, but, you know, that there's no black and white in nature, right? Um, and here I just have some, some uh, insects and, and arachnids just kind of sprinkled throughout the presentation to kind of keep y'all's mind on providing food in the, in the form of, uh, of insects and, and other creatures uh, for these birds during, during migration and the breeding season. So other species that, that don't really change, um, you have the Canada warbler, gorgeous, gorgeous bird, one of, one of my favorites, uh, favorite warblers out there. And then you have a can Canada warbler immature female right here. So you can see, see this big difference uh, but between the two. Um, and this one is going to look like a lot of other things out there, a lot of other warblers and, and birds that are out there. Um, and uh, just really, really tricky. Um, and let, me, let me just, I don't know if y'all can see this streaking right here, but it has this faint, faint necklace. Okay, you can obviously see this one, really, really contrasting with the body, um, really sharp, but you can barely see this. Um, nice eye ring right here, but there's other birds that, that kind of look like that with, with an eye ring. And we'll, we'll take a look at one here in just a little bit. Um, a bird that, that doesn't change, a, a nice um, black-throated blue warbler right here. Um, this one's pretty abundant in, definitely in the springtime, but in the fall time, we see quite a few of these. And one of the tougher birds to ID in the springtime and the fall time is the female uh, black-throated blue warbler. Um, but, you know, look at this eye line. Uh, the eyebrow right here, and then look at this little patch. The male has it too, but look at this little patch. Um, you know they call it a handkerchief, um, and you'll and and once you see that, you you know what you have. You have a brown bird with a with a white handkerchief. I don't know of anything else that uh, that has it other than this uh, black throated blue warbler. But I've I've seen them at at um, feeders. I've actually seen them um, eating berries from American Beauty Berry uh, a couple times. Uh, but they are insect. Well, they eat insects as well. Yes, ma'am. Becca asks a great question. Um, she wants to know if these are all birds we can see here in South Carolina. Yes, every one um, is a bird that you can see in South Carolina. 
Um, yeah, every, you know, you think about this one right here. All these birds um, are here in South Carolina. Um, so yeah, go, go out and find them. Uh, go again, I'm just gonna repeat it um, at least one more time. Go to, go to eBird and you'll see which birds have been seen in your county. Not, not just right now in the fall time, but just, just go on it, pull up your county. It'll, it'll show you every single bird that's been registered, I guess, through eBird or submitted through eBird um, on that website. And uh, those, are, those are birds. They may not breed here in South Carolina. Um, a lot of them will, uh, but they are birds that are passing through. You know, you think about spring migration, they're coming up from, from you know, South America, Central America, you know, coming to the United States or North America to breed. And then in the fall time, they're, they're going back down there for, for winter. So they might not uh, breed here, but they do pass through here. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to add um, that we did a great presentation that Jay hosted um, called Becoming a Better Birder, where he really goes in depth on the use of eBird and how to use the app. And I will make sure that we include that in today's recap email. So if you if you missed that presentation and you're confused a little bit about what we're saying about eBird, make sure to watch that presentation after this one and you will be all set. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so the, some of the migrants that, uh, have a, a major color change, I, I would say, um, I mean, when you, when you look at, uh, this and then you look at that, that's, that's pretty significant, right? Uh, so that's a magnolia warbler. Um, you know, some, some will be, uh, I guess, uh, more drastic than others. Um, if you have a really nice mature male, uh, you, you might, you know, retain more of this black right here, you know. Um, this one, you know, not so much, just has a little bit. Um, so you have to really key in on certain things. You know, we were talking about one Canada warbler earlier, that female, um, and you could see a little bit of a necklace here. Now that this isn't the bird, this is a magnolia warbler, but on that bird, the Canada warbler, let me see if I can remember which one that was. Um, you know, you don't see any streaking here. So um, you know, when you don't see streaking, you can, you can kind of cross off certain species, right? Uh, but on this one, th these are birds that really push through, uh, at least in our air area here around uh, Lake Murray, you know, Columbia, uh, I live in Chapin. Um, you know, these, these birds every single fall for the last, you know, six years ever since we moved back from Pennsylvania, um, I, I see a lot of these. Um, so uh, just kind of be on the lookout. That's why I chose these. Um, and because they have such a, a drastic change in their breeding and um, fall time uh, feathers. But look at this uh, chestnut sided warbler. Um, I mean, this is, look at this change, y'all. I mean, isn't, isn't that crazy? It looks like this during the breeding season and then it, it, can, it changes to this during the fall. Um, sometimes you'll see some with that, that maintain the, the chestnut. Um, a nice mature male, you know, will. will. Uh, but if you, if you see a bird that has this kind of like this limish green uh, coloration on top, uh, and you can even see the wing bars here kind of have this yellow tinge to it, um, you've probably got a chestnut sided warbler. And if you're not sure, um, just try to keep that image in your head and, and pull out the warbler guide and, and take a peek and uh, you'll, you'll narrow it down. All right. Oh, and those birds too, uh, mid to low canopy. So they're not very hard birds to find, these, uh, the, the magnolia warbler and the chestnut sided warbler. Um, a lot of times they'll be below eye level, um, but very rarely will I look up and, and there's one, you know, 50, 60, 70 feet in the air or in a tree. Uh, typically they're, they're eye level, maybe, you know, 15, 20 feet high, but uh, they're, they're, nice, um, they're nice birds to us, right? Uh, in terms of, of how close they, they they are whenever whenever we're, we're birding out there, um, kind of cooperative. So high canopy warblers, on the other hand, um, are the ones that you know you're looking at, you're looking at, and then all of a sudden you have to take a break because your neck's starting to hurt. Right? Everybody's had warbler neck, probably is is what us cool people call it, right? Ooh. Uh, warbler neck, um, you know, and that just, you, you seriously do, like I've heard of people going to chiropractors after a day of <laughs> birding because, you know, you're staring at birds, uh, you know, so high in the, in the trees and, and you get a little twinge in your, in your neck. 
Uh, so these are high canopy warblers. They're the ones that are, you know, uh, tough, tough to see a lot of times. Not to say they won't come down. Um, I know a fellow from Audubon here in South Carolina just had one uh, feeding in his uh, American Beautyberry. And then uh, a, a nice male, um, you know, decided to uh, bathe in his bird bath. So uh, if you don't have water in your, at, your, at your house or at, at your yard, um, you know, install a water feature and, and you'll have more birds. Uh, but, you know, this, these are Cape May warblers here, and look at the difference. Um, probably like a first year female right here, very, very drab bird. Um, and, and, you know, some pine warblers, uh, maybe a first year female, can look um, similar to this. Um, but, but look at these streaks. Um, they're a little bit more defined. Remember, on a, on a pine warbler, it's a little bit more diffused, right? They're not um, as contrasting. Um, and and uh, just not as fine lined as uh, this Cape May warbler. Um, so the wing patch, you can't really see it, uh, but it's but it's here and it's it's just a white wing patch. Okay, it doesn't have bars. Um, so this this one would have it, but this one hardly has a wing patch at all. Um, so just you know, it's one of those things where you just have to get out. Uh, kind of trial and error, make mistakes, learn from them, and, and then study. And, and you'll, you'll remember, you'll end up remembering these things slowly over time. Um, but a big difference between this bird and the black Burnian over here, which is a bird that, that we get, you know, every, every year coming down here in the fall, or both birds are, um, is this triangular, uh, you know, cheek patch, right? Um, so if you, you see kind of an orangish yellow throat, um, you can see it kind of, the, the color kind of comes down. This is a nice male right here. Um, and then you see this, this triangular cheek patch. There's really not another bird, you know, that has that triangle. Um, I know it's kind of tougher to see, um, probably on this, on this female is what I'm, I'm assuming here. Um, but you can, you can see that this doesn't have a triangle. Um, I mean, maybe your imagination will, will make you think that that's a triangle, but, but when you compare it to that, you know, uh, it, it's easy to tell it's not. But look at this, it has no streaking here on its, uh, on its throat, okay? But this does. So if, you, if you're kind of confused about this area, hey, is that a patch or not? Does it have streaking? Does it have streaking or does it not? If it has streaking, you, you've got a, a good chance that you have a Cape May. Uh, the one that the fellow from Audubon had at his house, it almost looked like a breeding male. It was a, it was, it was a nice mature male, um, and it's kind of, um, you know, it, it'd be hard to misidentify that one. It, it had a lot more color than, than either of these two birds. But this is, uh, this is definitely a male here, and that's, again, probably a first-year female. Uh, big difference there. But high up in the tree, so, you know, they're moving, they're, 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 they're high, they're, they're bouncing around yellow and green leaves. Uh, they're not sitting still, you know, like these, like these photographs uh, where you can uh, study. So, you know, just get out there. It's about repetition. So let's look at these, uh, you know, one more time. Um, you've got the pine warbler here. And who's thinking, hey, that's got a, that's got a triangular patch too, right? Um, I mean, every, there's, there's no, again, black and white, but when you look at this triangular patch, um, you know, that's, that's way more black Burnian than, than this one here. Um, and when you start seeing these streaks, okay, the, the pine warbler is not going to have that. So if you're convincing yourself that this is a triangular patch, does it have any streaking? Hmm, not really. Um, so you can kind of cross that out as a black Burnian for the most part. Uh, so pine warbler female, um, you've got the, the streaking here uh, on the black Burnian. You do have the streaking here on the Cape May warbler, but look, you have the streaking all the way up to the throat. Remember, the black Burnian is not going to have that, okay? And then you have a bay-breasted warbler here just to add to the confusion, and you've, you have these two wing bars, but look at the difference, okay? Black Burnians are going to be for, typically... Um, a lot smudgier. Remember, my, my son grabbing that crayon, smashing it down, and then, you know, doing that. Um, you know, that's, that's more of a, a black Burnian trait. These are a little bit finer. Um, so large warbler, it kind of moves a little sluggishly, you know, through the trees while foraging, not, you know, sporadically like maybe an American Red Start would do. Um, very little streaking, if, if any at all. Uh, typically doesn't have it, and I don't know if y'all can see this, but it, it you know, it, it has kind of a brownish uh, tinge to it. Um, if you 
see one with a lot of brown here, um, and it's a pretty large warbler, you probably have a bay-breasted warbler. Um, remember, the, the, the chestnut side of warbler can have you know, some, some chestnut or brown on the side too, um, but it's not gonna be as typically as much, and it's a, it's a smaller warbler. So, you know, with, with these are sitting here, here, there's four birds, and you've got one right here. You know, what do you think it is? Do you think it's a Cape May warbler, a Black Burnian warbler, a Bay Breasted warbler, or a Pine warbler? I'll just kind of let y'all uh, sit there for a second and try to figure it out for yourself. And I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Comment in the chat box which one you think it is. Yeah. You C or D. Look, wing bars. I mean, would y'all would y'all think that that bird has some streaking right there? Um, is there some yellow on it? I don't know, but it could be a female. Um, does it have a triangular uh, cheek patch? Mm, I don't see one. We got Doesn't a lot look. of C's and a lot of D's being submitted. Hmm. 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 And what could so it those, be? Those are great guesses, and I'm just going to go ahead and say There's I'm being. An a. I am being mean to y'all. Everybody is wrong because it's a trick question. It is a black pole warbler, y'all. And you know, look, there is another bird that that looks like these guys, right? Just another one. <laughs> like we needed another one. Um, but you know, when when I look at a black pole warbler, which again, this one, this one is, uh, look at this white. Uh, undertail covered is, is what it's called, but you know, it's, it's almost a bleach white, um, you know, fe feathers under its tail. Um, notice the streaking up here too. Uh, we typically don't get too many black pole warblers, um, you know, in a few, just the last few years. Um, I've, I've probably seen it submitted on eBird just a handful of times. Uh, a lot of them will fly from the Northeast right down nonstop uh, down to their wintering grounds uh, in the in the Caribbean. Uh, I, I think that's where they winter. Uh, maybe maybe down to South America, but they they usually or a lot of them I I should say um, fly nonstop. So we don't get too too many um, you know stopping here in South Carolina. But but if you do and you, you you have one in your in well you have a bird that you really can't identify in your yard. It has wing bars. Um, it it has this streaking up here, um, and then it has a, has a really white uh, undertail cover, um, these feathers right here under the tail. Um, you, you might have a Blackburnian uh, warbler. It could be easily confused with a um, uh, pine warbler, uh, but again, a pine warbler isn't gonna have that streaking you know, up there. Uh, I guess the problem with that is, are you going to be uh, at least eye level with a bird to where you can notice that streaking right there? Or is it going to position itself in a way above your head to where you can see its, uh, its, its back, right? Um, so really tricky bird, but look at this. Um, in the springtime, I see these birds all the time. Um, and so real beautiful bird um, in the springtime, look at that black cap, you know, kind of similar, similar you know, or to, a, to a chickadee, right? Um, but it has all this streaking right here. It, it, it's easy to, to uh, um, figure out if it's a chickadee or not um, during the springtime. But uh, it, it changes you know, drastically from, from spring plumage to uh, it, its fall plumage. Uh, great, great bird um, if you do catch one in the fall time. Uh, another uh, caterpillar, uh, and this comes from uh, not a blueberries, but it comes from one of our black willows that we have in our yard. And the black willows so far probably this year have uh, um, taken, taken the first place in how many caterpillars are, are produced uh, on plants um, in our yard. Uh, it, it just produces so many caterpillars. So if you have room for, uh, for one of our native willows, black willow, um, plant one in your yard. They, they kind of like to have wet feet from time to time. So if you have a low, low lying area in your yard, plant a black willow and uh, enjoy the caterpillars. It's, uh, it's really fun. So just a few more. Um, you know, we have a Nashville warbler right here. Um, you typically see those. Uh, the only one I've seen was, was at a clear cut or on a clear cut right by a, uh, a forest, um, uh, you know, some nice woods. Uh, so clear cut shrubby power lines right, right of ways next to, uh, next to some woods next to a forest. Um, you have a chance of, of seeing them there. Um, mid can canopy to, to shrubs. So, you know, you're not looking up high again. So this is another bird that kind of uh, cooperates with us. Yes, ma'am. 
Ben has asked a great question. He wants to know when a bird changes from breeding plumage to migratory plumage, does it grow new feathers that lack pigment or does the pigment change the exact same feather? Does the pigment change the exact same feather? What was that last part again? So when a bird changes its colors, the breeding plumage, uh, the migratory brand plumage. New yep, the brand new feathers. They are uh, brand new feathers. They just molted. You know, you, you come to a point in the summertime where, you know, you, you have birds singing, you have them very active, and then all of a sudden it kind of just drops off. Well, a lot of these birds are molting. They don't have, uh, you know, these, these sturdy feathers uh, anymore, um, these, these, you know, uh, mature feathers and uh, they're, they're kind of hunkering down. Uh, at that time, they're probably being a little bit more uh, secretive. Uh, but no, these are, these are new feathers, um, and well, the ones that do, do change. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not, it's not a change in pigmentation. They're, they're, they're just brand new feathers. Um, so Nashville warblers. Uh, so mid, mid canopy to shrubs, a palm warbler, this is another one that, that's kind of easy to see, uh, low canopy uh, to the ground. In the wintertime, uh, especially the closer you get to uh, the coast, you're going to see those uh, throughout the entire winter, or you could. Uh, go to places like Bear Island, um, Donnelly, uh, similar places, uh, and, and I've seen them on gravel roads quite, quite a bit. Um, you'll see them on, at fields you know, that are cut really short. Um, and they, they, they're they pretty little birds and they, they like to pump their tail a lot. Um, so if, if you see a, a bird kind of with this darkish cap, a nice eye, eye, eyebrow on it and, and maybe a little yellow and it's on the ground, it's pumping its tail, uh, it's probably gonna be a palm warbler. But they don't breed in South Carolina, but they either pass through during the fall time or they winter here, um, especially for those people who are around the coast. Um, and then you have a Tennessee warbler. Um, you know, Really, really beautiful warbler, in, in my opinion. A lot of people are just kind of tired of, of them, I guess, especially whenever they breed in their areas, just because they're not, you know, the, um, they don't have the brightest clothes on, right? They don't have the brightest feathers. But uh, I, I love them, um, and we, we just don't get to see them too, too often. And maybe that's one of the reasons why I love them so much. But, uh, you know, not too much of a contrasting bird. It doesn't have these great streaks on it. Uh, it doesn't have these patches, uh, but it's got this nice little kind of greenish yellow sheen to it if you if you get to see one uh, during migration. So really nice bird. Um, you know, the one that I, I've only seen one in my yard and it was last year we had a drought um, or it hadn't rained for a week or so. And I put my sprinkler on this one bush that was next to my um, uh, bird bath and I had probably five or six different warblers. Did, didn't see a warbler, uh, you know, for the last hour, put on the sprinkler uh, next to the bird bath, and all of a sudden I had, you know, warblers. Uh, I had a vireo. I remember seeing a white-eyed vireo, a yellow-throated vireo. So, you know, those little tricks during migration and uh, when, you, when you put on some water, uh, especially whenever it's been dry, uh, can really, can really uh, increase the birds that you see in your yard. All right, so hooded warb warblers uh, versus a Wilson's warbler. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, you, you kind of key in on these immatures and the, and the females to this little hood that's right here. Um, you, you can see this little cap that the Wilson warbler has, this little cap right here. This kind of goes all the, gently all the way into the back, right? Uh, this one kind of stops, and then you have this little gap, and then you, then you have the back. Uh, same you know, they're, they're pretty easy for the mature males. Uh, you know, black cap, this one has a black hood, but I'm, I guess I'm talking more of, about the, the, the females and then the, the immature males um, that are passing through during the, during the fall time. Um, so this one is going to have a pretty long tail, um, and it's going to move a lot different than a uh, hooded warbler would move. Um, and it's gonna be sporadic, another, you know, another Kramer bird. So it's going to really be bouncing around. Uh, it loves to be around uh, streams or maybe some ponds or lakes with, um, give me just one second. My family's coming in, <laughs> into the house right now and I'm a little distracted. Give me just one second. 
So while Jay is getting that settled, um, let's go ahead and jump in the chat box. What's one of the best birds that you have seen this year? Sorry about that. We had we had a family emergency. Um, no worries, Jay. I just asked people to to add in the chat box their favorite bird that they've seen this year. Um, no comments on that, so we should probably move ahead. Although Kelly says that little, um, I'm going to say it wrong, Tupi. How do you spell it? T-O-U-P-E-E. -E. How do you spell that one? Say that one. I'm not sure. Huh. Yeah. Both. But let's see. Sure. Oh, we got lots of comments coming in now. <laughs> County Woodpecker, a toupee. The little toupee is cute. Yes. Oh, oh the little toupee. Male. That makes sense. <laughs> um, um, you know, so, so um, you know, another... another Another tip um, is to just kind of learn their 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 habits and habitat. Um, so you know this this Wilson's warbler, which I've I've unfortunately for me I've, I've never seen. It would be a lifer a lifer bird for me if uh, when it, whenever I do see it. But I've gone to places where I thought it would be. So you know check willows on on stream sides or river sides. Check. Um, willows, they, they love willows around uh, ponds, around lakes. Um, and they're gonna be, you know, typically uh, relatively low in the canopy um, and uh, bouncing around, you know, kind of kind of uh, frantically as, as they feed. The hooded warbler is kind of a, uh, kind of a rec reclusive bird. It's not gonna move as fast as a Wilson's, even though they look alike, right? Um, typically the ones that I've seen in the fall time um, you know, you see, you look at this, how, how dark, kind of mossy green, and it kind of is even on the females or the immature males uh, or the immature birds. Um, so there's, there's little, little differences that can, that can kind of point you towards the, the right identification, and it'll get easier as you, as you practice. So habitat can tell you, you know, uh, what bird you're looking at. Um, a lot of times it can help you at least. Um, and then the, the, how the bird is acting can, can also ha help you. But you see on this Wilson's warbler, the one that has the toupee, um, you know, it does have this eyebrow. Um, this one has a little bit, but it kind of turns into this cheek patch. Uh, this this yellow cheek patch with which this one doesn't you know um, have, uh, but again these are uh, pictures of birds. Are are you going to be able to uh, figure that out or see those uh, details whenever you're in the field and the birds <laughs> bouncing around? All right, so I'm off off of my favorite birds, the the warblers, and we're on to other ones. Although I do love these too. So go ahead, y'all have probably already done it. Three thrushes really fast. I'm not going to do it because I can't. Uh, but I know y'all are at home doing it right now, and you probably sound really funny. Um, so these thrush or thrushes um, uh, come through each year, um, you know, South Carolina. Uh, I love it. I love finding these in, in the woods um, on our, you know, three acres here in Chapin. Um, and I'm just going to kind of give you some pointers on IDing these, these guys. Um, look at this right here. Woo! All these thrush, you know, have, have that little pot belly, right? Um, and, uh, you know, this one here, the wood thrush, it has this chocolatey, uh, beautiful brown on the back. And, uh, it's probably not probably, it has the whitest, um, you know, white on the, on the breast, the belly. Um, and it has these very, very contrasty, uh, spots. Um, and it, it has this beautiful white eye ring, you know, the white is so white, it looks like it's been bleached. Um, when you think of the Swainson's thrush, you know, look at this, they call it Buffy, right? It looks like, um, I don't know, you, you had some watered down chocolate milk and you just took this bird and, and dunked it head first into it. And it just kind of like gives us this, this subtle, you know, brown uh, around the throat, you know, down into the breast on some, you know, uh, this is just one, one picture of one bird. So uh, they're, they're not all going to look like this, but some have a little bit more brown here, but this one has a really nice uh, buffy color right here. Um, and I don't know if, yeah, y'all, y'all can probably see this, but in front of the eye, okay, the lures, uh, there is a little buffy area right there too. So uh, kind of looks like the, they call it spectacles. Um, it kind of looks like the bird has spectacles on. Uh, so you see buffy around here, you see buffy up here. Um, you, you probably have a Swainson's thrush. I know people have been posting them on eBird and on Instagram. Uh, so these birds are here right now. I haven't seen a gray cheek thrush uh, reported yet. 
Um, but you look at the difference here, uh, really, I mean, if at all, I don't think this bird, you could really say has an eye ring. Uh, this one, this one does, right? The Swainson's and, it, and it's that buffy kind of chocolatey milk color. Uh, this one definitely does, even though this picture doesn't show it too, too well, but it has a really bleached white uh, eye ring. But this gray cheek, cheek thrush really doesn't um, at all. But uh, no buffiness here, okay? You don't see any brown uh, right here. Um, and when you see these birds uh, out, they really do look gray. Uh, again, you've got this uh, beautiful chocolatey, you know, brown here. Um, and then you have this brown here. This one, you know, is, is a very gray uh, looking, looking bird. Um, and, and hopefully you'll be able to see that whenever, whenever you see that bird uh, out in the woods. But you're typically gonna see those birds uh, not in fields, uh, not on power lines. You're, you're usually gonna see these birds in the woods, okay? Uh, wood thrush is, is appropriately named. Um, so if you have a, a, a patch of woods around your, around your house, um, just kind of go there in the morning. Um, you know, I see mine a lot at around between the hours of three and five in, in my woods uh, almost every single year. Um, and they're, they're eating berries, they're eating seeds, they're also eating insects. Um, and I have this beautiful insect, another one on our blueberry uh, bush. Um, and I think it's a morning glory prominent. There's some other prominents out there, uh, which is a moth, uh, but this one kind of mimics a, a dead portion of a leaf. Uh, so these, these birds, um, you know, we'll find some of these, that camouflage is so good that I'm sure they'll, they'll pass up, you know, plenty of them. Um, but plant natives and get more birds. So, you know, these blue birds, not the, not the eastern blue bird, but these uh, indigo bunnings, the, the blue grosbeak here, um, <laughs> you know, look how dirty they, they end up becoming. Um, so uh, you, you've got the males right here, and then you've got the, the females or immatures up here. So if you see a small uh, brown bird uh, at a power line or in a field, uh, has kind of this conical bill, um, you know, not very big. Uh, it's not twitching like this blue gross beak. You, you probably have an indigo bunting this, this time of year. Now the sparrows will start coming down and, and you know, maybe you could be confused with, uh, or make the uh, mistake of IDing a, a, a sparrow um, or getting it confused with a, a bunting. But um, there's, there's really nothing that I can think of that you'll confuse this with other than this blue gross beak. Uh, but these blue gross beak, they have a lot bigger um, beak. They twitch all the time. Uh, typically, they're, they're making a, a, a kind of a distinct chip sound um, that'll kind of help you ID them, you know, by ear. And remember, this, this time of year, we don't really ID too, too many things by ear. But the blue gross beak uh, is still vocal, even though it's not singing. It has this uh, really neat chip sound. Uh, indigo bunting, you know, is, is going to be vocal a little bit. Uh, but not too much and it just doesn't twitch. Uh, so if you see a brown bird, it's really acting like Kramer from Seinfeld. Um, you know, you probably have a, a blue gross beak, either immature or female. Um, but these dirty, dirty blue birds right here, uh, just focus in uh, on the, on the bit bill size um, and the rusty wing patches, uh, the large bill, the rusty wing patches, you have a blue gross beak um, and the conical bill, small bill, uh, no, no real wing patches to speak of. You've, you've got an indigo bunting. Um, but those birds, you know, a lot of them are still here, but they're, they're going to be gone uh, probably by, the, by mid to, to end of October, even though you'll get a straggler from time to time. Yes, ma'am. A couple comments about hummingbirds. Um, so Dennis says, we haven't seen our hummingbirds at our feeders for several days now in the upstate. Are they gone until next year? And he's still in the low country. Um, and then Melissa actually said that they still have plenty of hummingbirds in the low country. So, yeah, yeah. So they're, you know, maybe, maybe yours are, are gone, but others should come. I wouldn't take down the hummingbird feeders yet. So, so keep them up. Um, if you'd like, um, you know, others will pass through and, and stop by and kind of hang out for a little bit. Um, I'll probably take mine down, you know, the end of October. You're not going to keep the birds here by or too long by keeping up um, the, the hummingbird food. Um, so, but you know, for those stragglers that are coming through late, you know, for whatever reason um, that may be, um, I, I, I'll probably keep mine up, uh, you know, through at least mid-October. Um, but no, they're, they're still here. I, you know, I have two feeders and 
uh, they're they're still going uh, strong at at both of them, and and I'm, I'm in the Midlands, so um, y'all, and and I think at the coast, I, I swear that I've heard that um, some people have had hummingbirds, uh, you know, ruby ruby throated in the in the winter time down there. So I don't know if they're if that's a trend or if that's just you know kind of of something um, that's uh, just kind of happened one year. Uh, but you know, if I was on the coast, I'm, I might be tempted to keep my hummingbird feeder up a little bit more through the winter. Um, be on the lookout for rose-breasted grosbeak. I'm really not going to confuse this bird with anything, even even this female or the immature. Um, you know, uh, the purple the purple finch, I guess maybe, but it you know we don't have any purple finch right now. That's a winter bird that sometimes comes to South Carolina. But if you see this this bird, um, it looks like a huge finch, I guess. Um, with this this big seed cracking bill um, and this bright bright eyebrow and and the streaking you you've got a uh, you've got a um, rose breasted grosbeak um, maybe a female house finch you know you could confuse it with but it's going to be quite a bit bigger um, the house finch is going to have this this beautiful uh, white um, eyebrow uh, the mature male obviously is uh, nothing looks like that. And you might see some kind of, <laughs> kind of some rough looking immature males out there. Kind of feel sorry for that guy right there. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're being reported right now on, uh, on eBird uh, quite a bit. Um, so they're pushing through right now. Um, if you have feeders up, you, uh, a lot of times uh, they'll stop by feeders, um, but uh, they're not vocalizing really um, anymore. So you can't really rely on that, but just, what I would say is whenever you're outside and you see something move in a tree, just look at it. Uh, whether, whether or not that, that tree has had, you know, uh, tufted titmice, um, you know, chickadees in it, uh, Carolina wrens, you know, the whole, the whole morning. If you see something move, just look at it. You, you just never know when that, that really uh, kind of neat um, bird's gonna come through. Um, so don't, don't dismiss anything that, that moves. Sometimes you're gonna be looking at at least that are moving. Uh, you know, you might you might put your binoculars up and find a butterfly. But the more the more you look, you know, the, the more aggressively you look, um, you know, this time of year, the the, the better off you're going to be in, in terms of how many species you're going to find. All right, so we're getting up, we're getting to an hour right here. So I'm I'm just going to wrap this up. Um, but this is if you've if you've been on one of my classes, this this is a quote that I that I like to put. <clears throat> to put on, uh, on my presentations, but in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. Um, so, you know, you can see that we start them young, y'all. I mean, come on. That, that kid is now, I think, about nine months old, 10 months old, and he can already ID, I think, 14 species by ear. Um, I'm totally joking, but uh, yeah, that was at a, that was at a, a conservation and cocktails uh, a conservation um, event that we had uh, last year. Um, and uh, obviously, this this mama didn't drink anything there, but it was a it was a fun night, and it brought uh, it was just a subdivision that got together to learn about birds and conservation uh, last fall. It was really fun, um, but you know the money that that we do take in is used to to create you know nature lovers um and I, I do love uh starting them young or we do love that um i love you know knowing that there's a six-year-old uh daughter on this on this webinar that's uh being introduced to to birds um and when we when we give these nature presentations you know we we always talk about litter you know drive around any street in south carolina and you'll see roadside litter um, you know, and, and when we saw this Anhinga last year in a pond in, in the Irmo area, um, you know, it had, uh, you know, problems feeding and it had, it looked like to me, it had some of that uh, plastic netting that we put around our plants to keep the deer away, which I've purchased before, but I'll never purchase it again. Um, so, you know, you go out there, you look at nature, you, you start seeing their challenges, and then you start um, adjusting how you purchase or, or what you purchase. Um, you know, you might, you might become more involved in, in your local government um, and, uh, you know, just more active in the community. Uh, wildlife, uh, they have a lot of challenges and, um, you know, we do want to open up the, the everybody's eyes, not just kids, but adults too. We want to open up everyone's eyes to the beauty of, of nature, but you, you learn about all these challenges and, uh, 
it could get you to, to, to change how you live um, and to change how, how you are in the community. So, um, you know, the, the money that we do take in, uh, you know, is, is used a lot for, for education. And um, I really do believe um, every, every word of this, this quote. Um, if, you, if you're not taught it, <laughs> you're not going to understand it. If you don't understand it, you're probably not going to love it. Uh, but you do care for everything you love. Um, and then uh, another thing that we've done that I'm, that I'm proud of uh, is Project Prothonotary. In the last, uh, in under two years, we've installed, um, or at least helped install, 259 uh, boxes for the Prothonotary Warbler. We've partnered with U.S. Forestry. We've partnered with DNR. We've partnered with uh, private plantation owners, um, you know, and and more that I'm forgetting about uh, parks, you know, state parks and uh, private parks. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully in the next couple of years, that number will, will grow, grow to around, you know, five or 600 boxes. Um, so just, just another thing that, you know, the, the money goes to. Um, class that I'm excited about because I always talk about caterpillars and, and insects and, and arachnids is a, is a class that's coming up on April 7th, but look how beautiful planting with natives can be. Uh, this house is uh, here in the Midlands of South Carolina. Uh, this was about three years ago on the left-hand side, and this is what it looks like now. Um, and he plants around, I think around 70% native plants. Uh, no invasives, so you don't want to implant uh, invasive, but there are some foreign plants that, that don't take over ecosystems. <clears throat> um, so, uh, you know, when I think about native plants like this, I think about all the caterpillars. And in the last week and a half on our property here in Chapin, we've, we've identified 19 new species, okay? 19 new species of caterpillars. And it's not just me, you know, going out there, but I have a 10 year old, well, soon to be 10 year old and a five year old and a, uh, and a beautiful wife. And uh, we all four, we, we just go out and look for caterpillars now. Uh, I mean, it, it's just a great time of year. Now that it's cooled down, it's comfortable. Um, but these caterpillars are fantastic. They're spectacular, uh, beautiful. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's ingraining in, in my boys, uh, you know, heads that uh, native plants are important. And this is why, you know, they produce the food that that wildlife needs. So um, I hope y'all tune in on October 7th to learn, you know, how you can, you know, change your yard if it does look like this into something, you know, spectacular by using, you know, native plants. Um, so that's the end of this presentation. Um, you know, there's, there's great resources out there. Again, uh, eBird, um, the Warbler Guide, um, Merlin Bird ID, um, allaboutbirds.org. Um, me, you can email me. I'd be happy to help you identify a bird or um, if you have any questions on where to go in the state to bird, um, you know, just, just uh, send me an email. It's jjay at scwf.org. Again, jay at scwf.org. I'd be ha happy to help you. Um, but I appreciate y'all uh, sticking around. I hope you learned something. I hope you liked it. And um, if you if you if you want more classes and you enjoyed these, uh, you know, think about think about donating um, so we can continue to provide this content uh, during these COVID times. But uh, I appreciate y'all. And on that note, while you've got that gorgeous slide up of the before and after, it's super important to note how um, helpful native plants are as we continue to see things like climate change um, affecting these migratory bird species. So native plants are great for these migratory birds. Uh, we also want to give a big shout out to Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's Outdoor Education Fund. Um, they normally sponsor our women's outdoor retreat, but they're helping us by sponsoring many of these webinars so we can continue to give them out for free. Um, and then Jay, there was a quick question um, I want to scroll back up to. Um, yeah, and if y'all have any questions, I'll, I'll hang out for a little bit. I, I you know, I'm, I want to be sensitive to y'all's time, but um, I have I have a little bit of time if y'all have any more questions. Greg wants to know if you see evening gross beaks in the Midlands this time of year. Let's, Woo! Let's I, you pay question. <laughs> evening grow speaks. If, if somebody if somebody saw an evening grow speak, you would have probably hundreds of people dive dive bombing this one area, if not if not more. Um, that as far as I know, they haven't been seen in in years and years and years and years.
years um, it, around this area. I know last year, I think there was a push um, of some from way up north, and I think they got as far down as North Carolina, but it was very spotty. That's a bird that I, we would just have to get really, really lucky to, to, to see that here in South Carolina. They, they just don't come down this far. Um, uh, too, too often. I think they used to uh, more in the past. I have no idea if anything changed or, or what changed. Um, but that's just a bird that um, I haven't, I mean, I've been back in South Carolina for six years and I don't think I've seen one reported uh, here. If you do see that one, you let me know, please. <laughs> I think that's the only other question right now. Um, we will send out recordings of this class and all the wonderful resources that Jay mentioned in the presentation. All right. Thanks, guys. See you later. All right. Bye, y'all.